Hello everyone, Tyler from Meeple Mountain here with another board game review for you. Today we have Baron Voodoo from Lucky Duck Games. This is an exciting one, it's a very beautiful game uh, and we are excited to share this with you. Baron Samdi, Law of the Dead, has decided to abdicate his throne to one of the four Loas that are competing for his favor. They're going to have to work pretty hard to impress him to take his throne, and Baron Samdi is looking to find the Loa who is the most skilled at guiding the souls of the deceased into the spirit world. We're going to showcase this competition in the form of a dice collecting game where you will take on the role of one of the four Loas in this competition, collecting dice, sometimes your own, sometimes an opponent's, into your capture zone and then putting them into your spirit worlds in various sets based on color or dice face value, all to collect victory points for the souls that you lead to the spirit world. The winner will be the Loa who is most successful at making the most points quickly by guiding spirits into the spirit world, and uh, they'll become the next Baron Samdi. So join us at the table, let's jump in and learn a little bit about this beautiful game of Baron Voodoo. Baron Voodoo is a victory point competitive game where you take on the role of one of four Loas competing for Baron Samdi's fame and, and favor so that you may eventually ascend and become the next Laua of the dead. So in this game, you will be competing to collect dice that are on this middle tray by having dice jump over opponent's dice, collecting them to your tray. For instance, if I was the orange player, I could choose to activate one of my orange dice to jump over and capture one of the green player's dice. This dice would then go into my capture zone here where I would collect it and ultimately turn it in and move it to the spirit world where I would gain victory points and souls working to compete. The game ends when one Lawa reaches a set number of victory points based on the player count, which is 12 for four players, 15 for three, or 18 for two. Play continues in rounds with each player taking very simple turns where they will either activate their asymmetric ability they will capture a dice, or they may choose to activate their asymmetric ability after they capture a dice. The only addition to this is offering tokens. Players may spend these to adjust a dice face that they capture on their turn, or they may spend two of these back to the pool to take an additional action. You can only do this once per turn, but ultimately you could have two capture actions in a single turn if you have the offering tokens. Now, this may seem incredibly simple or rudimentary, but the depth of strategy comes into play as the board continues to evolve and players take turns. You see, as you make jump actions, dice start to pile up. This makes the dice below them impossible to access. So as players continue to move and capture dice, eventually there will be columns no higher than three dice that will continue to emerge. There may even be situations where dice are left isolated and unable to move or jump in any direction as things continue to progress and evolve. This is when your asymmetric powers come into play, where you'll need to start shuffling or maneuvering the dice around in order to maximize your efficiency in turn. Now, you may have already noticed that there is a corresponding color of dice to every player in the game, but there's also white dice. These are Baron Samdi's dice. These count as wild for the purposes of turning in dice in from your capture zone to the spirit world for points, but also whoever has the most of these dice in the spirit world gains Baron Samdi's blessing. This will cover up their asymmetric ability and will allow them to utilize the ability of any other Lawa in play for free. This is quite a powerful upgrade and gives you a lot more control over what happens on the board. So let's go ahead and look at the board and talk a little bit more about the dice faces and the options that they have. And we'll also look at a player board specifically to understand what you do with dice once you capture them and how you maximize your score and victory points. Every Lawa has a board that looks very similar to this one with the exception that every Lawa has a asymmetric ability that they can use to manipulate dice on the main board. 
Your board is broken into your capture zone at the top and your spirit zone at the bottom, where you will send dice in order to gain victory points. Again, you're looking to compete to get a set number of victory points before any other player based on the player size. Now, the way that you gain points is listed out over here on the left-hand side. You can gain points in increments of 1, 3, or 5 based on the number of dice that you turn in from your capture zone to the spirit world on your turn. Now, you can gain one point if you send two dice that have different colors but the same symbol. So, for instance, this green and orange dice have the same symbol. If I move those to the spirit world on my turn, I could gain one point. I could do the same if I turned in two dice of the same color with different faces. Now, as you can see, that goes up from two to three to four, allowing you to gain the maximum number of points. So, of course, as you go, you're going to want to collect as many dice as you can in your capture zone for the biggest influx of points once you move them to the spirit world. The thing to note is that your dice in the capture zone are vulnerable to capture and swap by your opponent, so you have to be careful how long you hold on to them. Now, it's important to note that white dice, as I mentioned, from Baron Samdi are wild in the purposes of color, so they could count as a color requirement for anything, but their face value still matters. You do have a little bit of control over which dice face you pull in, as when you capture a dice, you can spend an offering token back to the supply in order to change the face to any value that you would like. That gives you a lot of control in how you move to collect dice. Let's talk a little bit about the particulars of each dice face in the game. Let's talk a little bit more about the dice face bonuses and the benefits that they will give to you as a player. Now, let's say for this illustration that I am the orange player. Anytime you capture a dice from an opponent or a white dice, you will gain the benefit on that dice face. But that's it. When you capture a dice from your own face value, along with getting the bonus listed on that dice, you will also get an additional offering token, which opens up a lot of options to you as a player. So while it's not always good to take one of your own dice as it limits the options that you have on the main board, you can use it to your advantage to gain additional offering tokens and take more actions later. Now, let's talk about each of these actions and the benefits and, and damage that they can uh, incur to yourself or your opponents. The first one here in the green dice is very simple. When you get this, you will get an offering token. It's very easy, it's very helpful, it's a great option. The red dice here will infer, confer to you one additional victory point. This is great, it's a great way to gain additional points quick and get ahead of your opponents. This dice here on the white dice will allow you to change the face value of one dice that's in your capture zone, including this one. So I could change this red dice to match the face value of the white dice in such a way that I would be gaining or setting up to gain additional points when I move them to my spirit world. Now let's talk about some dice that allow some player interaction. So first we have this little hand here on the orange dice. This is a capture dice. This allows you to take a dice from your opponent's spirit world and put it to yours. Now, this does not give you any initial direct bonus right away, but what it does do is it sets you up for bonus points at the end of the game because at the end of the game, you're going to look and see who has the most dice of each color in the spirit world. If you have the most of a certain color, say orange, you would get three additional victory points at that time. Time. So in this way, you're taking a dice from an opponent and giving it to you is a swing of two in a color battle at the end of the game for bonus points. This can be very, very powerful. Here on this purple dice, we have another way to take dice or borrow them, we'll say, from another player. This allows you to swap dice with a player who has a dice in their capture zone. So for instance, if I had this, I could swap this orange dice that was in my capture zone and give it to another Loa and take a dice that they had in their capture zone, perhaps maybe this green dice. Now, that's a lot, and you might think, that's really mean. Well, how do I stop that? Well, here we go. On this dice value here, we have this little shield symbol. This will allow you to flip your protection token. Again, let's pretend that I'm the orange player in this case. If I have this protection token face up, what this means is that no one can capture a dice from me on the main board. They cannot capture orange dice until the start of my next turn and you can't take dice from my player board as well. This gives me a turn of safety to just completely focus on getting points without having to worry about people messing up my dice on the main board or stealing the items that I have collected and set up maybe for point game. This can be incredibly powerful as well in protecting you and ensuring that your strategy comes to fruition.
As I touched on earlier, each Loa has a specific power granted to them by Baron Samdi throughout the game. So let's talk a little bit about each of those. Over here we have the orange player, and we can see her power is listed here. Her power allows you to gather all the dice from a line and move them towards the edge of the game board. So I could select these, pull them down, run these over, whatever I could do to start crunching things together so that I then again can start jumping and taking actions with those dice. It's a very, very powerful ability. Next we have Green over here, and his ability is to move all of the dice from a column, except the one directly on the game board, and place them freely on any other dice on the game board. So for instance, I could take this dice here. He's not touching the board, but he's on a column. I could take him and I could put him on any other dice I want. So I could move him to cover this white dice, whatever I want. But that gives you a lot of flexibility and allows you access to things that are lower uh, on the game board, which can be very helpful as well. Red's power is that it lets you move a single die to an empty spot on the same row of the game board. So I could take a single die, let's say it was this one, and I can move it to an empty spot in the same row. So I could move this down, move it over, whatever I need to do. Uh, that can also be very, very helpful. The last is our purple player, who allows you to switch two isolated dice on the game board. Now remember, isolated are dice that are not surrounded and are not able to make jumps because there are gaps uh, for them and they cannot cross those. Those are the four powers in the game, and again, you can use your action at the start of your turn or at the end of your turn. You can also choose to pay an offering to another player to activate their ability as well. So you could choose, if I was a green player, I could forego my ability and pay one to activate the yellow player's ability and take their action instead of my own. Now you can't take multiple powers and use them in the same turn, but it is nice to have the option to access your opponent's powers as well. Whoever has the most white dice in their uh, spirit world area is then granted the title of Baron Samdi temporarily, and he grants them the power of all of the Lawas in the game. So you can use anybody's ability, and you don't even have to pay the one offering to do so. In this way, you have tons of freedom to begin to bend and, and adjust the board to your will. So gathering these white dice and getting them into your spirit world can be very, very powerful. Now, don't forget, there is a dice face on the board that allows allows you to steal dice from your opponent's spirit world. So even if I have white dice now, if another player, say purple, was able to capture this and move it to their spirit world, now they have more white dice than I do, they gain the title of Baron Sam D temporarily. I've granted his powers instead of me. So that will always be in flux throughout a game, but that's a very powerful aspect to keep in mind as well. And that is how you play Baron Voodoo. I hope you enjoy getting a quick glimpse and walkthrough of how to utilize your, your powers and the dice that are at your disposal to become the next Baron Samdi. I hope it got you excited to check out and experience this game. But what did I think of it? Well, when I first was proposed the opportunity to review this game, I was really intrigued. Now, to my memory, there's not a lot of games in this theme or genre that just jumped out to me. And so I was really excited to explore how the designers dove into this really neat and interesting world of voodoo and how they process death uh, and spirits in the afterlife. And, and I was really interested to see how that played out in a dice game. And so it's, it's really creative. It's really unique. Uh, there's not a lot of titles like this that jump out to my mind where you're kind of playing a, a tactical set collection, almost, you could argue, a little bit of a dash of area control thrown in on the main board, of course, with asymmetric powers and some additional flavor brought in by the offering tokens and how you use those. But really, this is a dice collecting game. So of course, at the start of the game, you're rolling all the dice and setting these out, unless you're playing with a game variant where these are predetermined. It, the board is always gonna be a little wild and a little unpredictable, of course, your starting areas are kind of pre-laid out for you, so you know there's going to be a general dispersal of the dice, but you don't know what dice face you're getting and where those are exactly going to land, and that, that just a dash of randomness really spices up the game to me, personally. I love all of the options that come to your disposal because you have these questions that you have to ask yourself. Let's say I'm the, the orange player here. Do I want to start collecting my own dice? Do I want to start adding those so I get additional offerings so I can take additional turns and, and start using that? But if I do, I limit my options down the road in where I can go, what, what dice I can jump, how I can collect. I could limit myself right out of the game if I'm not careful. Or do I want to start taking the white dice so that I can then become Baron Samdi and start taking advantage of all the powers on the board to really optimize my turns. 
Obviously, then the other question is, do I want to start taking my opponent's dice to really limit their opportunities on the board and how they play and interact? And of course, while you're thinking about all this, you still have to say, okay, I want to make sure I'm getting dice faces that allow me to do the types of actions that I need to do. And that was my favorite part is obviously on each of these dice, there are six different results that you could get from additional victory points to protection from theft or the ability to steal or swap dice with opponents. And I really liked that aspect of the game. Um, Varen Voodoo is not a take that game, but there is just enough uh, of that little player interaction to really mess up the best laid plans. Uh, we were playing a game and I was all lined up. I've got all my nice uh, colored pieces here set for a big point cash in. I was ready to go and somebody decided to just pop and grab one of the colored dice that I needed. And I was so frustrated for a moment because I had this wonderful plan of how I was going to get all these points and it was just taken away from me because of the player interaction. And it didn't take me out of the game. It didn't ruin the experience, but it was flavorful. It was fun. Just enough to remind you like, oh yeah, this is a competition. There are other players and they're active on this board too. And just when you capture things, it, they're not safe. There's still a way that you can mess with your opponents. And I love that. Uh, Baron Voodoo plays in a really nice chunk of time. You're looking at 45 minutes to an hour, depending on your player count. Uh, and it's just a quick, fun game to get to the table. I feel like it's a game that's easy to teach. It's accessible but there is a good chunk of strategy by how you stack the the dice and, and, and do you want to move your columns? Do you want to kind of keep some tactical advantage? How do you get to dice that are locked in on the lower levels? Uh, there's just a lot of interplay on the main board and it gets really thinky. Uh, it's quite fun. I really enjoyed some of the mental conundrums that I found myself in as I was navigating the main board looking to capture dice uh, and send them to my spirit world and get points. So I would really say Baron Voodoo is a nice light to mid-weight game that really fits nicely in your collection. Is it, It's accessible. It has a really nice um, entry point for people learning this game, so it's not so deep or advanced that it's going to uh, turn away uh, gamers who are looking for a lighter experience, but it has enough strategy and enough interaction and, and control of what's going on around you that you can't say that this is a, an easy game or it's on training wheels. Like You definitely are the architect of your fate uh, in Baron Voodoo, and I really like that. I love that you have control uh, of how the game plays out and how interactions occur in the game. And it's really, really positive. It's really good. I would give this game, because it's in such a unique genre, uh, I would definitely say this was a standout game to me. It's one that I'm really excited to add to my personal collection. And uh, I would give this game a 7.5 out of 10. It's really solid. It doesn't have a lot of rough edges that need to smooth out. It's just a fun, nice interaction that has um, some really good mechanics in it. Now, the only thing of note that I will say is that because you have asymmetric powers, you may find that some of the opponent's powers, in your opinion, my opinion, may be stronger or, or seem more beneficial than maybe the one you possess. That's, of course, always the danger of asymmetry, right? But I would say that each of these powers are balanced and has a really great opportunity where they're incredibly useful. And perhaps in your game, they didn't pop out or jump out at you. But overall, I feel like this game has a, a great deal of balance and is quite enjoyable across the board. Uh, I think that this will be one that will fit into any collection uh, and you'll, you'll quite enjoy the opportunities to bring this out to the table and showcase it to people. So again, I would give this a 7.5 out of 10. I think it's a game that you'll definitely want to check out. It is kind of, again, this unique genre. I don't really have a perfect genre or, or category of game to drop it into, but I think it's one that you'll like. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite thinky and enjoyable. So if you're interested, if you think the theme is attractive, if you like the colorful artwork or the idea of this really interesting strategy of, of interactions on this main board with these dice, I would encourage you to check out Baron Voodoo by Lucky Duck Games. You won't be disappointed. I'm sure that you will uh, really enjoy your experience with it as I did. Thanks for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Check out some of our other Meeple Mountain content. I promise you won't be disappointed. This is Tyler Williams, signing off.